Hello, I'm John Foster, and I'm a medical doctor who does Social Security disability exams. And today I'm going to talk about disability and COVID-19. As usual, everything I say reflects my own opinions based on my own experience and study, and not the opinions of the Social Security Administration or any other medical body. Now, two things prompted me to choose this topic. First, over the past year to year and a half, I've begun seeing people disabled from COVID-19 or people who've had COVID-19 and completely or partially recovered in my social security disability practice. And second, in the past week, I've had and recovered from COVID-19 myself. To begin with, here's a few tips I learned from my experience with COVID-19. Number one, your initial test may be negative. I was negative about 12 hours after onset of symptoms, but strongly positive 24 hours after onset of symptoms. Number two, Paxlovid really helped me. Paxlovid is a combination of two antivirals. It comes in a package. You take two pills twice a day for five days. It's best taken as soon as possible after the diagnosis of COVID-19. And I began at about 24 hours after onset of symptoms. 10 hours later, I felt improved. Not all better, but improved. And I continued to improve over the next four to five days. Next, you want to arrange for how you'll get the Paxlovid in advance because I was definitely not operating at full capacity when I tested positive and needed to get the Paxlovid prescription. Next, three things to keep on hand. Number one, a fever reducer. I took Tylenol. My temperature only got as high as 100.1, but I did have chills and sweats. Number two, a sports drink. I took Gatorade. In the first 24 hours, I could barely stand up because I felt like I was going to pass out, and Gatorade really helped that. And number three, some sort of cough or sore throat lozenges. I had quite an intense sore throat, and having some sore throat lozenges really helped. Now, as usual, when it comes to COVID-19 or any other disabling medical condition, always keep in mind disability means that you have medical problems that prevent you from working. And you must always look at your issues from both angles. If you have medical problems, but they do not prevent you from working, a common example would be a high blood pressure then Social Security will not approve your application. Likewise, if you have difficulty working, but it's not caused by medical problems, and those medical problems can be physical or psychological or some combination of both, then again, Social Security won't approve your disability application. Now, there are two common ways to have an application approved. The first is to have one medical condition that seriously limits your ability to work. And that usually means the medical condition has to be pretty serious itself. Unfortunately, the best thing for a disability application is the worst thing for the patient. The second way is to have two or more medical problems, neither of which by itself would be considered disabling, but added together by a formula that Social Security keeps secret equals enough problems that Social Security will approve a claim. And I've seen both situations where it came to COVID-19 patients. The next thing to know is unlike many conditions that have been present for hundreds if not thousands of years such as strokes and rheumatoid arthritis there's a lot still unknown about COVID-19 
because it's only been around since sometime in the fall of 2019 and really only been around in North America since the winter of 2020. We do not know what will happen to people who are ill from COVID-19 in 5, 10, 15, 20 years. My best guess is that some people will completely recover rapidly. Some people may take a long time, but will completely recover. And some people may have permanent problems that never go away. An example is a person that I know had COVID in September of 2020 and completely lost their sense of taste and smell, and it's never come back. I suspect that's permanent. Another issue is that COVID is mutating and changing rapidly. What I got today is not the same virus that my friend got in September of 2020. As predicted, COVID is mutating to become more infectious, more resistant to vaccines, and less deadly. So how do I approach a patient who's had COVID-19 and is in for a social security disability exam? Well, first I ask them, did they get all better or do they still have problems as a result of their COVID infection? If they got all better, then I note that in the past medical history, but it's not really relevant to their disability exam. If they complain of persistent problems, the first thing I want to assess is how severe their COVID infection was. And I want to know, number one, did they have to see a doctor? Number two, did they get admitted to the hospital? Admitted means they stayed in the hospital at least overnight, not that they went to the emergency department and were sent home. Number three, were they admitted to the intensive care unit? Number four, if they were in the intensive care unit, did they have to be on a ventilator? And if so, for how long? And number five, did they have to have what's called ECMO, which stands for extracorporeal membrane oxygenator? It's reserved for the absolute worst lung cases in COVID-19 and other diseases and indicates that the person was very close to death. In my experience, people with serious problems as a result of COVID-19 generally were admitted to the intensive care unit and most of them were on a ventilator, often for weeks or over a month. Now here we run into another problem because it's well known that prolonged stays in the intensive care unit cause all sorts of problems in and of themselves. For example, somebody who spends a month in the intensive care unit is hardly moving at all and they very rapidly lose strength, muscle mass and bone density they're liable to become malnourished and also have other issues such as blood clots, which can form easily in the body if the body doesn't move. I've seen four groups of problems as a result of COVID-19 infections. The first are breathing difficulties. COVID-19 can cause an intense pneumonia and in some of the severe cases of pneumonia, the lungs may not heal completely. In fact, there may be permanent scarring of the lungs. These people tend to be short of breath long after their COVID infection has gone away. They may or may not have a cough, may or may not cough up phlegm or blood. It's quite significant if the person appears short of breath just sitting in a chair giving me the history. For people claiming disability due to shortness of breath as a result of a COVID infection, you can expect that Social Security may order pulmonary function tests 
These are special scientific tests of lung function where you go to a pulmonary function lab and breathe in and out and forcefully through a mouthpiece. This lets Social Security determine exactly how much lung function you have or may have lost. The second issue is issues relating to blood clots. For some reason, the spike proteins of COVID-19 seem to make blood clot easier. And there can be blood clots in vessels all over the body, and that can cause damage. And as I already mentioned, being immobilized in the hospital or in an intensive care unit also predisposes a person to blood clots. So COVID-19 on a ventilator in the intensive care unit is a real setup for blood clots. I've seen patients with blood clots in their legs and blood clots in their lungs, although they've also been reported in the heart and in the brain as well. The third group of problems are related to the nervous system, and these are quite puzzling. I've seen a couple of patients with very severe neurological sequelae of COVID-19 infection that are totally unexplained. For example, I saw a patient in their early 40s who'd been on a ventilator for about six weeks. They'd completely recovered their lung function, no shortness of breath, no cough. Their thinking and memory were fine. However, their legs were extremely weak so that they could barely stand up and could not walk even one step without using a walker. However, the strength in the arms was completely normal. I have no idea what's wrong with that patient and neither do their doctors. However, I have seen multiple patients with muscle strength loss, sensation loss, shrinkage of muscles, and it's important to do a detailed neurological examination in patients who've recovered from COVID-19. The final group of symptoms is what I find the most difficult to assess, and these are what I call neurocognitive. This is problems with thinking and memory. It also includes long-term fatigue, now, there is no doubt that some people who recover from COVID have long-term fatigue, trouble with memory, or trouble with thinking. However, these symptoms are also some of the most common symptoms reported in patients who are functional or hypochondriacal, and how to sort out the two is very difficult. I've seen a couple of patients where I felt very strongly that they were having difficulty with their thinking and or memory due to COVID, and a couple where I thought that their complaints of trouble with thinking and memory were likely functional. In these cases, I recommend referral to a Social Security psychologist for a formal psychological assessment because I just don't have the time and knowledge to be absolutely certain. Now, the last thing I want to mention is a psychological manifestation of COVID that I've seen in more than one patient, and it's called catastrophization. Catastrophization is a term from cognitive behavioral therapy, and it refers to a tendency of some people to regard a setback or problem as the end of the world. In other words, making a mountain out of a molehill. I first saw this in Social Security patients, in patients who come down with cancer, had been treated, whether that involved surgery, chemotherapy, or radiation, and had made an apparent cure. They were years out from their cancer diagnosis and treatment, but they acted as though their life was over and they were about to die. 
Now, I have a lot of sympathy for such people. A cancer diagnosis is absolutely terrifying, and I can certainly imagine that it can be a severe psychological shock that can take a long time to get over. However, I don't think it best to treat these patients as if they are, their lives are over and they're about to die. I think the best thing for them is to gently ease back into normal life. And I'm seeing the same thing in folks who've had COVID. They've had COVID, they've made a complete recovery. I can see no evidence of any permanent medical harm, but they seem to feel as though their life is over and they're ready to die. These people are not going to have their disability claims approved and although that may make them initially unhappy, I think that's for the best. Well, I hope this has been useful, and as always, remember, if it happens, it's possible.